Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. We know today is a really popular subject and that's why we're extremely excited to have Zoo, uh, Sue join us today. So before we get started, we'll just have to uh, cover a couple of housekeeping duties. Sorry about that. So as with all our webinars, they will be recorded. Um, these uh, links to the recording and the slides will be sent to you a couple of days after the, the completion of this webinar. And uh, you'll also find your CVD points in there as well. Um, to the right, you'll see there's a little box where you can enter any questions. Um, please feel free to ask and we will um, cover them as many as we can at the end of Sue's presentation. And finally, if you would like to, to share what you're doing on the social media world and engage in conversation about this webinar, please use the hashtag NetWealthInvest or tweet us at, net, at NetWealthInvest. Um, well, let me just introduce to you our speaker today. We are very pleased to have Sue Viskovic, the founder of national consulting business Elixir Consulting in today. As well as that, she is a proud mother of four, a sought after speaker, a business coach, and author of a number of books and programs designed for advisors. She is also the proud recipient of the 2015 Mentor of the Year Award. So with over 15 years experience in financial services, Sue has built her career and her business in helping financial advisors, accountants, and risk specialists to improve the way that they run their businesses and deliver advice. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Sue. Thanks so much, Liam. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, uh, it's a beautiful day here in Melbourne. I hope it is wherever you are around Australia as well. We're, uh, we're going to be talking all things pricing today. Uh, now, it, it's, uh, it's a massive topic. I know it is an incredibly uh, important topic in businesses and particularly in the environment that we're in at the moment it's um, it is a really important one for people to be looking into and getting improvement on in their business um, I have a huge amount of knowledge to share with you in the next hour. My intention is that I will be speaking for about 45 minutes. I'll be sharing an awful lot of knowledge with you in that time. And then we're hoping to keep 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session for any questions. So by all means, feel free to jot your questions down in the chat box as we go. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll circle back at the end and make sure that we can uh, cover off on as many as we have. So you are all here today because you want to know what other advisors charge and uh, I guess the little graphic that we've got on screen now, the little cartoon, if you're wanting to get the, the silver bullet, if you're wanting the blueprint from me today on exactly how to do this, uh, unfortunately I can't do that for you. Uh, one of the biggest findings that we have uh, taken from the research that I'm sharing with you today is, is one that's consistent with the last three editions that we've done and that is there really is not one single model that is going to solve all of the challenges and be perfect for every advice business. There just isn't a silver bullet for this. Um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't surprise me anymore but it does that I will come away from interviews and I often talk about this with Lana, my co-writer on the research that you know, we'll, we'll interview one advisor and they'll be so passionate about their business and they'll be able to articulate their model so brilliantly that we're completely convinced that that's a, a great, great model that, you know, we'd, I'd love to be that advisor's uh, client. So, for example, I was talking to one advisor who was very strong in that his whole proposition is around investment management and he manages client portfolios with direct equities uh, and he that's all pretty much everything that he does for his clients. He'll do strategy work, he does tax structuring and SMSFs but the large majority of clients are with him because of his investment returns and so he charges an asset based fee um, which matches that value proposition and he was saying he doesn't even have client service agreements. He have, obviously has fee disclosure statements 
it's an opt-in, but he hasn't doesn't have a structured service agreement with a structured client review process because he says to his clients, I am here to manage your portfolio. Anytime you need me, you reach out. Um, and he was telling me that the morning we spoke, he had an, a client that had been with him for 13 years, hadn't seen him face to face for 13 years, and he'd just been in that morning um, giving him another million dollars to invest. So you hear a story like that and you look at the pricing model that works beautifully for that firm. And then the next interview is an advisor that's position is all about strategy and helping clients make better decisions and uh, their education and their behavioural management process that helps clients get their goals. And they talk about the fact that the investment is the smallest piece of the puzzle, that that's done by, um, uh, by passive uh, management that is not, the advisor doesn't hold himself out to be the investment expert. Uh, and he has a, a flat fee pricing model. Uh, he has very structured engagement and very high engagement with his clients. And that works perfectly for his clients. So um, this is about Pricing predominantly, obviously, is what we're talking about, but pricing is so intertwined with the service model and the type of clients that you're dealing with. So let's just, um, I want to dig in here to uh, to some of the, 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 the background behind what I'm talking about. So Liam so kindly introduced me and talked a little bit about Alexa. I just want to touch on that very briefly. For those that don't know very much about us, um, we do get a lot of uh, a lot of press, and I do a lot of speaking engagements, and we write articles about business management in financial planning. Largely, pricing is is a hot topic because we are we are experts in that space. We've got a team of consultants around the country that work intimately with advisor businesses, and we are very good at communicating together. So we share a not, lot of knowledge around the team. So some of the things I will talk to you about today are coming from our interpretation of the research. It's important to know that we are not a quantitative research company. Um, we do have very thorough research capabilities, but our first, our priority in our business is the fact that we are business coaches and consultants. So this is not about quantitative data only. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we started this research almost 10 years ago was that we work with businesses largely around um, improving their business business performance. A lot of that has to do with pricing. We just couldn't find any really good quality um, empirical research on it. So I started to do it myself when I first launched Alexa. So what I'm sharing with you today is going to be the fourth edition of the research. But we dig into the qualitative elements of people's pricing models. I'm going to share some numbers with you today and that's great. But numbers don't mean a lot if you don't have the context uh, behind how they're used and the impact that they're having on the business. So that's the sort of stuff I'm sharing with you today and, and as you've got on the screen there too, we've written materials, I've written a book called Pricing Advice, my latest book last year was around um, the value of insurance advice and we've got online software as well that actually helps people to do this. But what I'm talking about today is findings from our Advisor Pricing Models Research Report. Uh, so as I said, this is the fourth edition. Now I wanted to say that it's hot off the press, um, but it actually hasn't even gone to press yet. Uh, so we will actually be launching the research uh, the week after Easter. So we've got about a week to go before it actually comes out to the market. So the knowledge that I'm sharing with you today is very, very fresh um, and, and for that reason I'm just going to give you a little disclaimer. I do a lot of these engagements and, and speaking and some of you may see me around the traps over the next year or so talking about some of this stuff. Um, I have been buried uh, with my team in this information for about the last two to three weeks and when I say buried I mean literally burning the midnight oil. I have lived and breathed this for the last few weeks but we may have the odd question come up that I can't answer off the top of my tongue and I won't if I'm not confident with the answer because there's just so much data here to go through but I have an awful lot to share. So we're going to get uh, stuck straight in. I think it's important that you understand the context behind the research and who's actually in there and where have we got this data from. So some of you may have seen or possibly even participated. We run an online survey that is very, um, very in-depth and it's actually quite intuitive. So the way that somebody answers one question will depend on the other questions that come up because we keep them very tailored to the model that people are using. We ended up with 320 complete responses to that. We, we actually got a few more than that, but we do a lot of work in cleansing the data to make sure that if there's anybody deciding to um, share a few little... Uh, 
little furfies that we can look through that fairly fairly quickly and um, and remove any um, bad data if you like. Uh, so we've got 320 participants all up. We also do a series of interviews as well and sometimes they are people that we know in the field, Some, sometimes it's people that have approached us that have got an interesting model and we also dig through the online data so when it, wherever we're seeing something a little bit unusual, something new, something we want to find out more about, we do an in-depth interview with the, uh, the participant to find out more about the context. Really important to know that we have a con um, confidentiality agreement with everybody so all the participants are comfortable in sharing their information that's quite intimate and, and personal to a business but they know that whilst we might share the information we're never going to share the identity of the people. But you can see on the map there around Australia we've got a really good spread. Unfortunately we didn't get anybody from the NT this time which is a, a new thing for us but we have a good spread uh, around the states. We also have good spread across different licensees and I think this is really important because we are starting to see some various different trends between uh, advisors that are licensed through, for example, large um, institutions versus the boutique and small licensees. So you can see the legend there, basically large for us in our terminology here is um, licensees that have got more than 500 advisors in total licensed by the parent company and of course you go all the way down to the small licensee and then the self-license who is just a, a boutique um, business that has their own license and they don't license anyone else beneath them. So it's quite great to see that we've got a really good spread across the smaller licensees. It hasn't been, uh, the research hasn't been dominated by the larger groups which I'm particularly happy to see. We've got a good spread by gender. I would have loved to have seen um, a little bit more female, um, oh, my apologies I didn't move that slide then. So there's your split between the different licensees. Um, the split by gender, uh, it would have been nicer to have a, a larger representation of females but we've got 16.82% of the group were female. Uh, I guess that's probably uh, indicative of the principal ownership uh, in business around the country. Um, and then if we have a look at the, uh, the type of business that we spoke to, uh, people identified themselves uh, by genre if you like. So 61% of the participants were financial advice, 30% identified themselves as a multidisciplinary advice business. So that's more than two disciplines, it might be accounting, risk, financial advice, there might be mortgage broking in there. We had 5% accounting and financial advice and 4% were risk specialists. So um, one of the important things for us and it's getting, um, it's really important that we have external representation beyond the elixir contacts that we have but this research is all about finding out what people are doing in the marketplace, not necessarily how we're influencing. So we made sure that there were less than 12% of the people in the group who had actually utilised elixir services to help them figure out their pricing. So what we're talking about here is what's happening in the marketplace. So I want to get stuck straight in and share one of the first findings with you um, and, and it's probably no surprise to anybody but pricing absolutely affects pretty much everything in your business. A lot of people are aware obviously it's going to affect the profit of a business but it certainly also has an impact on cash flow, business valuation, the client value proposition, it's a bit of a chicken and egg about what comes first, the value proposition or the pricing model, they have to have congruence in order for it to make a, a successful business but it definitely will affect your ability to win clients, your satisfaction and even the engagement that you have with your clients. So one of the things that we did ask all of the participants was about their profitability because we want to know which models are working really well. And for any of you that saw me speak at the IFA Business Strategy Day uh, a couple of weeks ago, I actually shared some of the initial findings and at that point we had I think it was about 160 people that had done the research. Um, and you might have seen this figure, uh, the target that advisors were aiming for was 35% EBIT. Now it's important to know that we normalise this, so we asked participants to normalise the principal salary in the business at 150000 and then consider what EBIT uh, or profit margin and they were wanting to achieve after that uh, principal salary was normalised. So what people were aiming for was 35% which is great, that's a number that's kind of shared uh, fairly often, not really any surprises there. But we also then asked what profit are you actually enjoying now on the same basis normalising the principal salary and once we completed the entire research and got all of the participants um, on board we found that the average EBIT was actually 22.97%. That's a little bit higher than what we first saw when we only took a cut of the first half of the data. I don't know whether that means that the uh, the advisors with more uh, higher profit businesses were too busy to respond to the first request to do the, the research or not, I don't know. 
So there's something interesting on the screen here that you might have noticed. I've shared with you here the, um, the average uh, EBIT that people were enjoying as well as the median. And so for those, those of you who know um, statistics, this is going to be no surprise to you, but the average of a data set is, is the number of um, values in the data set that the, sorry, the representation of the values in the data set divided by the number of figures there are. So, uh, you know, if everybody's on 10 and we've got 10, um, uh, 10 participants, it's 10 times 10 divided by 10 and that gives you your average figure. But if you have outliers, so if you've got uh, one or two figures right at the top end or right at the bottom end, that's really going to sway um, the figures. So sometimes it's interesting to also look at the median figure and that basically is the middle point where there's the same number of figures below that and the same number of figures above that. So right the way throughout the research, wherever we've found that there's been more than a 5% differential in those two figures, we've actually shared the median as well. And the reason why we've shared that in this particular uh, incidence is that we did have a low figure. So it's important to see when we're talking EBIT, if people have normalised their salary to 150k for the principal, anybody that's got a negative EBIT means that they're not even earning that much as the principal. Um, but we then, so the, the lowest was 12.21% uh, in negative. Uh, the highest was 90% EBIT. Now I know there's a few of you sitting around there going, oh, I call something on that. Um, this is a really interesting one because that jumped out at me as well. I thought, oh geez, how can somebody have 90% EBIT? And I actually looked at uh, this business had two advisors. I thought, okay, well they're going to have to be sitting on at least a four mil turnover to make that happen. We looked across the data with the numbers they were sharing and what they were charging. It was consistent. They were definitely at the higher end. But we interviewed this uh, particular advisor and uh, yeah, believe it or not, they are sitting on a 90% EBIT, this particular business. They work from the advisor's home. They have high net worth um, clients that they go out and see on their premises. Uh, very low uh, cost to run the business, very good PI cover, very low audit costs and, um, and a significant value that they're charging as an asset based fee. So it is possible to hit a 90% EBIT because that's quite out of the norm. If you look at the actual um, if you look at the, sorry, I'll just get the mouse here so I can just show you on the screen. If you look at the uh, the bar charts across here, just to help you understand what that looks like, um, what this is really saying is that between, if you look at the the trend uh, trend line upwards here, we're saying here that there were 26.07% of the participants were enjoying between 10 and 20% EBIT on that normalised basis. So I think it's important to be able to see that spread because averages only tell you a very small part of the story, but that's where the different um, uh, EBIT measures are being enjoyed in the different businesses. Now, that does not tell you whether it's a great business or not. It's important to understand that when, when we're talking EBIT, we're talking a moment in time. So sometimes a business will be enjoying a really great EBIT because everybody is absolutely smashed and under the pump and everyone's too busy to, to even scratch themselves. Um, but then they put on more staff uh, and then that affects their EBIT because their costs have gone up before they, uh, they can necessarily bring on new revenue. So the capacity is better, but their EBIT gets hit. So you're, you've got to take this with a grain of salt because it does depend on the timing of the business and when, where they are at their, in their cycle. Um, but the longer a business uh, is, is running and the more recurring revenue they have, the less of an impact those wobbles will have. So uh, let's have a look at the um, actual ongoing pricing models that we're seeing in businesses. So one of the things that we uh, we really wanted to drill into, we had a look at the upfront pricing and the ongoing pricing, but this, this is quite an interesting figure that I thought you might like to have a look at. Um, in answer to the question, how do you structure your ongoing fees for the majority of your clients? We are finding a, a significant swing away from asset-based fees. So uh, this time around, out of the 320 participants, 15% are charging a purely asset-based fee for their ongoing advice. Now, when I say significant, in our last research, which was taken two years ago, we were saying we were already seeing a trend away from asset-based fees. At that time, they were still sitting at 34% of the, of the group, and now that's dropped to 15%, which is quite significant. The other thing that's significant about these findings is that while we're seeing 47% have chosen a flat retainer, again, that's lifted, but what has significantly lifted since the last one was this one over here being the hybrid of a flat retainer and an asset-based fee. And what that is, is where a business will charge uh, a, a flat fee 
fee that is specifically um, dollar orientated, we will charge this much per month or this much per year but they also apply an asset-based fee as well to any of the assets that they manage directly. Uh, so typically, you know, we're still seeing, oh gosh, um, I think the asset-based fee when it's purely asset-based, I didn't put this in here, but I think from memory it's about 0.93, where you're seeing the hybrid of a flat and asset-based, it's down more to around the 0.4 mark. Um, so there are a few others and often people people pull that out and go, oh, what are these other figures? So the kind of things that we're saying there, some people, um, you know, for example, there was one that said they have a unique model of no ongoing fees for investment advice and they just charge ad hoc initial fees for every engagement. Uh, there was another business that charged only upon clients receiving a review. So again, it was quite transactional. Um, but a lot of the others within that um, other group of the 7%, uh, some of them were saying things like, uh, you know, we have... Uh, a lot of the older client base is on a percentage fee, but we're switching all of our newer clients to a flat fee for where possible. Um, there was one that said uh, they had smaller balances, they charge 1.1 until that matches a minimum ongoing, which was interesting because that's the opposite to a lot of others that have said they have a minimum ongoing and then they charge an asset base fee above that. So there are a, a significant variety of different models being used. The um, the one thing I would say though um, is you can see there there's the 4% of hourly rates and as a consultant I have to say that's fairly pleasing to me because I know um, certainly the people that we speak to and the businesses that we consult to. Uh, I love this saying and some of you may have seen me share it before but that is the you know don't go into business where you're selling time because it is the one thing that you just can't get more of. Um, so when you're looking at your pricing model, an hourly rate model is used quite frequently by advisors for uh, a transactional piece of work. So if it's project related or if it's something where you don't know the full extent to the piece of work but it's um, it's in addition to their retainer, it can work quite well. But as a standalone model for pricing all of your advice, it's not the best option for a, an advice business because it's very difficult to get the leverage that you can get through other models. So um, well, that, that's a quick look on ongoing fees in terms of the models. Uh, I want to start sharing some numbers with you around pricing uh, engagement fees. So the terminology that we, we get advisors to use throughout the uh, upfront piece is we, we check in is do they charge an upfront fee um, and of that how do they structure it. So do they charge it as one fee that covers the whole process from inquiry right through to fact find SOA implementation or do they split it. Some will have a plan fee and then an implementation fee. Um, some even will have an initial discovery fee and then an advice fee and then an implementation fee. Um, we've got all of that in the research. But what I wanted to share with you was that the key finding that I think is perhaps really interesting um, and that is all around the timing. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of people will talk to us when they're figuring out their pricing model and, and a lot of it is in the timing and they're saying, well, when do I approach fees with a client? At what point is the best time to actually quote the fee and get their engagement? So if we look at the people in the, in the research, there were 225 participants who said that they charged their clients some type of upfront fee. So when we look at the, the timing of it, 4.7% of them uh, quoted their fee prior to the first appointment, so they used it as a pre-qualifier. 64.4%, um, so the large majority uh, quoted their fee either during or as a follow-up to the first appointment. But what's important here is that they quote the fee before they do any of the strategy or analysis work for them. So I'm going to come back to that point in a moment. 29.5% quoted their fee at the second appointment after assessing the client's situation and already drafting some of the strategies. And then there were 1.4 which was other. Um, so there were a couple of little iterations on that. But what I wanted to see is then, well, having a look at the timing of the fee, that's interesting to see when people position it, but does that have an influence on the actual amount that people are able to charge for a new client? And what we found there will surprise some people. Um, so the average engagement fee for comprehensive advice, so in this terminology, this is from the inquiry all the way through to providing the advice and implementing it, regardless of whether they split that or charged it as one fee. But the average for comprehensive was $3,577 plus GST, where the fee was quoted and they sought engagement from the client prior to doing the strategy work. And, and I guess 
curious um, prior to revealing their intellectual property of what they're going to provide to the client in advice. The average for those who quoted it after drafting the strategies and talking about what they were going to advise the clients with was $3,507. Now, I have put a note there, the median for each was $3,300. Is this really statistically significant? Now, if I was just a statistician, I would look at that and go, oh, not really, it's only $70 difference. There's not a massive amount of difference there. But this is significant when you're in a position when you're considering when do I position the fee? And I know that there are advisors that are lacking confidence and thinking, how do I ask my client to pay a fee when they can't see how clever I am yet? They don't know what I'm going to provide to them in the way of advice. They don't know how good my strategies are going to be. So how do I get them to commit? to a fee sight unseen and just ask them to trust me that I know what I'm talking about. So this has given us the, um, the evidence, I guess, to say that no, you don't have to prove yourself by showing your advice before the client will see value and engage with you. Um, what we did find, of course, is people absolutely need to be able to see value in engaging you as their advisor and taking your advice, but that doesn't have to come in the form of the specific advice itself. Now, to me, that makes sense because how does the client know whether you're giving good advice or not because they don't have the technical competence that you do, but what they do want to know is that the advisor absolutely understands them. They do have a really good thorough knowledge of the client's situation and can sit in their, in, in their seat, if you like. They can see their life through their eyes and, and understand what's important to them and that they have the skills and ability to take that knowledge and turn it into something that's meaningful for the client. Uh, so on this um, chart here, this is where we've got this, this, this histogram chart, which I really like, which shows you the spread of the different fees that people are charging. And Similar to what we saw before, the dark blue columns are where the engagement fee is quoted before completing the strategy work and the light, lighter green are the engagement fee quoted after assessing the situation. So what's interesting here is that we see between the, uh, the, the ones that quote the fee prior to providing advice, there were 13.37 that charged between two and a half and three and a half and yet 37.84 charged in that band when they uh, were quoting the fee uh, at the same time or while giving uh, a high level view of the strategies. Uh, then if you look at the next bracket between three and a half and four and a half thousand, that's where the large majority, so 35.47% of those who quoted their fee before showing their advice uh, were sitting in that bracket. So some quite interesting findings there. Um, so jumping ahead, I'm, I'm mindful of time. I know I'm throwing a whole bunch of information at you here, um, but I know that there's a, a lot of uh, questions that are gonna, going to come up. So I'll, I'll, I'll push through uh, and we'll, we'll come back to questions at the end. So one of the important things at the moment clearly is around pricing advice um, on insurance. Uh, we know this is probably going to be one of the, your biggest headaches over the next few years. We know now that the LAF is coming in from January. Uh, we know that the upfront um, pricing uh, or upfront commission models are going to be uh, a thing of the past and we're moving to hybrids where within two years the maximum amount you'll get for upfront is 60% commission. So. We really wanted to dig in a lot around insurance and for those of you who were uh, um, awake at the beginning, you might have seen that there was actually only 4% of the participants were a uh, risk specialist advice business. Um, and, and when I talk to advisors in the marketplace, there's a lot of risk specialists that are really concerned about the LAF coming in. and. They are, a lot have not started moving to fees, where it, what, which is why it's no surprise that we didn't have an awful lot of them participate in this fee research. Um, but what we did distinguish really clearly was the difference between advisors providing advice, so providing financial advice that included risk insurance and those that provided risk insurance on a standalone basis. So quite a lot of them in this research were financial advisors that included risk in their offer, but what I'm talking about right now and the figures I'm about to share with you are specifically when they're providing advice on, on just purely risk advice alone. Now we know there were quite a few in the research said that they didn't do this, so if a client presents to them wanting insurance advice only, um, they'll either refer them on to somebody else or they'll quickly identify that they do have other needs and so they provide additional advice. But the figures I'm talking about here are from those advisors who, who do just provide that specific insurance only. So interesting, 92.4% of them will take insurance commissions in some 
way, shape or form. Uh, and you're going to see in a moment there's a combination between what they do with those commissions and, and whether they supplement them with fees. And it's no surprise that we have been in the market um, and we have been talking to a lot of advisors about the fact that if they are heavily reliant upon 120% upfront commission and if that's going to drop by half in the next couple of years, then they may find themselves in a position where they're going to need to start subsidising their advice with a fee. Um, it's one of the findings that we will share at length um, uh, when we have a little bit more time. This is one part of a, a broader presentation here, but one of the things that we will talk about is the fact that uh, there's, there is a lot of resistance for advisors moving to a complete fee model for insurance, and that's absolutely not surprising. It is a complex area of advice. Um, but what we are seeing is that there are some starting to do so, and I'm going to share that, but I think in terms of what's in the best interests of clients, in the best interests of advisors, uh, that it is uh, you know, not considered to be the be-all and end-all. Uh, I'm not going to start using a crystal ball about the future direction of insurance commissions. We can only deal with the information that we have at hand now and what we know the LAF is going to look like. Um, but I guess we should all be thankful, um, and as much as that hurts some people, we should be thankful that we ended up with the LAF where it is at the moment and it didn't jump to uh, a, a really flat 20% level or no commissions because I just think that would have decimated the insurance advice industry. But having a look at... Um, at the participants that were in this particular research. So there were 250 of them who provide insurance only advice. So 52.8% of those do that on a commission only basis. And there was a variety of the different types of um, uh, you know, commission options they took. 35.2% charge a fee of some description, and I'll dig into that in a second. Um, and there were 12% in there who sometimes charge a fee. And for those ones, it, it was, um, you know, they might say, well, it depends on the client. If the, if the client has uh, significant cash flow issues and they're struggling to pay the premium, then we will just do it on a commission-only basis. Um, others saying that, you know, we always do it where we have commissions rebated, so the, the premiums are dropping. There's a, a bit of a mix across the, the whole group, but in terms of the actual fee models, um, of those who do charge a fee to provide advice on insurance only, these are the different models that we're seeing. So 23% of them charge a fee only uh, and they either refund uh, the commission or they write the policies with nil commission. We're only seeing a couple of them in the group will take the commission and then physically refund it. The large majority of those that do charge insurance advice on a fee only basis will do so writing the premiums with nil commission so the client's actually getting the ongoing discount on the premium. Now, that is quite significant. I think the last time we did this research a couple of years ago, there were, I think, 13 advisors um, in total who did that. Uh, that number's lifted to 19. Again, that's not saying anything about uh, I wouldn't call that a massive swing and that, you know, this is the way the industry is going by any stretch of the imagination. But um, it does show that there are some clients and some businesses that exa do exactly that. They don't have any commissions whatsoever and all of their advice is provided on a fee basis. And you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, I have shared with you the average fee that was charged by those advisors who take nil commission. Now, I'll specify this. Uh, that average is $2,508. Now, that was when we asked specifically around what was the fee that they would charge to a client in this situation on the average across their business. So the, the typical fee for their typical client is sitting at 2508 We also asked separately what was the highest amount they had charged for a client with insurance needs. And so those figures were quite different. So um, the average figure between the group for what they charged their highest um, insurance case was $5,234 and the highest figure that we saw in there was $15,000. Now I'm going to put a little caveat on that is that I do have one more interview left with a risk specialist advisor and I do believe that they have a higher figure that they've charged as their, their highest amount ever. Uh, but when I spoke to that advisor a couple of weeks ago, uh, that case was still in process. So they had quoted the fee, the client had engaged with it and signed on, uh, but they hadn't actually paid their invoice yet. So um, uh, I'll be checking in with him tomorrow and we'll be finding where the uh, outcome of that. But looking at these other things on the screen, 18% 
of the advisors charge an advice fee and the upfront commission. So this is the typical model where it's quoted as an advice fee and then the commission is taken, if you like, as a, an implementation fee. Um, you can see that the majority that do that actually take the hybrid commission. So the advice fee plus a hybrid commission was used by 36%. And that is where they keep the whole commission. So um, the next numbers at the bottom of the screen, so 8% take the advice fee and the level. The next three figures are where they might take an advice fee and they will take the upfront commission, but they'll offset that against their fee. So either they'll charge the fee and then uh, refund some of that after the commission comes in, or they have an overall, um, you know, there was one advisor that considers it as a fee account, so saying to the client, this is this is your annual fee, this is what your account's sitting at, and then as the commission comes in, that offsets it against whatever their fee account is sitting at. So 5% do that with the upfront, 9% do it with a hybrid and 1% do that uh, where they offset their advice fee by the level commission. We also dug into ongoing fees and so forth, but I, I just had to pull a few highlights of the research for you today because I know uh, there's um, seriously some significant amounts of data in there. So moving on from the insurance advice only was um, I wanted to share with you one of the case studies that we did with the advisors. So um, Part of the research was that we were talking, so everything that we've talked about up until now was in a hypothetical situation. So from a business perspective, what are the fees that you typically charge for your different clients? And, and we, we varied the question set somewhere around what are the minimum fees that you'll charge? Then we're saying, well, what's the typical fee that you'd charge for the majority of the clients that you sit in front of? And then what are the highest levels? So we got that really deep depth of information. And that's really interesting when you're talking from the business perspective, but then you also want to have a look at how does that apply in a client situation. So with specific clients, a different business model um, can have a massive impact on the dollar amount that they would charge. So what we uh, did in the research is that we actually used six different client case studies and we asked every participant to quote the fees that they would charge any one of these, all of these clients. They, they went through the whole process. The risk specialists only, um, obviously we only give, gave them case studies one and two. Uh, but we gave people the choice to either say these clients are not in my target market and I wouldn't provide advice to them uh, or if they would, we got them to quote their initial fee. We also got them to quote their ongoing fee and then go into some detail around what kind of services would they be providing to those clients on an ongoing basis. So I've just pulled out um, for today one case study being case study number five um, and this was Peter and Lisa. Uh, and I've just pulled out what people charge as an upfront fee to them. So really quick rundown, Peter and Lisa, 67 and 65 uh, years old, they're happily retired, they're about to spend six months sailing on their yacht and they're looking for an advisor to take over the management of their investments because until now Peter has managed his own SMSF. So Peter would now like to step back a little from this responsibility, he's also looking for an advisor to provide an overview on their complex financial affairs and advice on how they should manage their affairs in the future. It's important to them that their children are provided for both now and in the future and that their income needs are met and risk is managed within their portfolio. So they've got personal assets including their home of 1.5 mil, they had personal investments of 350 and 1.6 mil in their self-managed super fund. So we had two retiree clients as case studies. This was the one that had uh, a, a not insignificant sum of money and the other one was one that, that was uh, had a smaller amount of money and needing some Centrelink support. So what did we find with the engagement fees? So that's the bit that I pulled out here, bearing in mind, remember that engagement fees cover the inquiry through to provision of advice and then implementation of that advice. So with Peter and Lisa, we found 14.8% of the participants said that they, uh, they weren't in their target market, so they didn't quote a fee. The lowest fee for engagement for these clients was $500. The highest fee charged by any of them was $20,000 and the average sat there at the $4,641 mark. So as you can see across these, this uh, histogram chart here, there is a significant spread across all of the different value sets. So um, you know there were 8% of them that charged between $1,000 and sorry, $1,600 and $2,200 uh, and there were still 15% that charged them between $5,200 and $5,800. So uh, Peter and Lisa could have walked into any advice business and been charged any one of those fees between $500 and $20,000 to be able to do their initial financial plan, which is a really nice segue to come back to the my first point and that is 
there just isn't a single model that will work in every business for every client. So uh, it's uh, it's all about finding the model that works for the client base that you want to deal with, that works for the type of service that you want to provide, and that is going to achieve the financial benefits that you're looking for in your firm. Throughout the research, we, we cut the data a million different ways depending on the way people ask questions. So quite often uh, we wanted to drill in and see things like, you know, do women charge more than men? Do uh, the high profit firms, um, you know, is there a significant difference in their pricing? Uh, and, and, you know, we sort of go into that in some detail. But what I would definitely say is that, you know, in, in light of this fact that there's not a single model, it's really around finding the the or having a good thorough understanding of what you're actually standing for as a business, who you're aiming to work with, the types of services that you're going to provide them and how you can deliver that at a point that's valuable to the client and achieves your profit margin. And as much as we say it's about the price, it's got so many other impacts within your business because uh, a lot of businesses have found that their costs have increased uh, over the last five years and so a large part of their pricing also comes down to getting efficient and, uh, and building better systems and processes uh, within their business so that they don't necessarily have to keep passing on those costs to their clients. So I'm going to wrap for questions in just a second but I did want to share with you um, you know, when you're talking about how to be successful, uh, you know, the big findings that we had really were drilled down to, I guess, three things. So the key ingredients when you're successfully pricing. One is mindset. Um, now that's a little bit tricky because it's quite a um, an intangible thing. So yeah, yes, we can get a cost to serve calculator. Yes, we can crunch your numbers, but a large part of it comes down to the mindset of the advisor and their self belief and their ability to understand their own value and worth. And sometimes that actually has um, a lot further impact than just their own worth in terms of a business perspective. So that that certainly goes a little bit deep. But the second thing that it comes down to is confidence. The two are definitely interlinked, but if an advisor has confidence in the model that they're promoting and the fee that they're charging for it, that certainly is reflected in the clients engaging with it. And then the last thing is an outstanding value proposition. And again, you can't hold one value proposition straight up another against another and compare them. This is around the proposition to the client base that that advisor is working with, um, whether it be you know smaller clients that have significant Centrelink issues or whether it be larger clients that have got significant sums of money and a great amount of complexity. Whoever the client is, it's about having this great proposition that perfectly suits their needs, that the advisor can deliver a service at a value valuable fee um, to both the client and the advisor. So uh, as much as it's great and I love research and everybody's always wanting to know how does everybody else do it and you can get a lot of information from that, a lot of that will often help with these in, um, issues around your own self-confidence and your mindset. Um, but certainly don't underestimate the value of doing this work in your business so that you live it and breathe it. Um, and for those of you who own a business where you've got other advisors in your practice, don't underestimate the value and power of bringing them along on that journey with you um, because that goes a long way to helping them get the right mindset and the confidence in positioning the fees. So, um, okay, we're going to go to questions now. Just before I do that, I will share with you um, what are we going to do from here. So, as I said, the research will be published and in the market from, uh, I think it's Easter Tuesday, so that's Tuesday week. And because we're doing this um, this this pre a preview, I guess you could call it, with that net wealth. We're actually going to offer um, a special offer to the people on the webinar today. Uh, we can't keep this open permanently, though. So uh, this is really only for people who want to place an order before Tuesday midnight. So if any of you want to purchase the research, it comes in three different. Uh, packages. So those uh, wanting the full report, which has got all of the information in there, that comes out in hard copy only. That's retailing at $14.99, so $1,500. Yes, there's a lot of information. Yes, it's very valuable and expensive to get hold of. Um, we're also releasing Advisor Insights summary versions. So these are going to be digital downloads that, um, that people can access. If you're a risk specialist and you just want to look at the risk advice insights, that's $199. Or if you're a financial advisor that has risk 
risk as well. That's $299 and for anybody on the webinar, if you want to get access to that, we will offer you a 20% discount for pre-orders provided that they're received by Tuesday midnight. So I know the Net Wealth crew are going to send you out an email after this webinar with a recording and that email will also include a link that you can go to uh, to access that special. And we're more than happy to do that. So now let's open it up. I know there's a bazillion questions sitting in there that I've tried to uh, to not look at so that I can concentrate on what I'm doing here. Um, oh, where are we? Okay, so goodness me, where am I going to start here, Liam? Anything that's jumped out of you? Uh, so there's one one here. Hi Sue, did you find that most advice firms are using service agreements um, and it, do you find they're necessary or can they be used as a marketing document to outline value or are they just another piece of paper being given to a client? Tanya, that's a great question. Um, yes, the large majority did take a um, uh, have a client service agreement and I guess Sometimes people look at that as being a, a compliance document because you have to be able to demonstrate what you're doing for the fee and then you have to track back against that with your opt-in um, uh, and your fee disclosure statements. But what we saw with the successful firms is they really did use it as part of their engagement process with their clients. Um, and you can see that it's uh, that, that just tends to make sense. You know, if I was going to go and pay for an advisor and they're going to be looking after my, uh, my affairs and it's an ongoing fee, whether it's coming out of my product or my bank account, you know, I'd want to see fit, fit, fairly clearly what's going to happen um, and what they're actually going to be uh, delivering for those fees. So uh, they're, they're used quite successfully by advisors. Um, and some of them that we've seen are not necessarily legal documents uh, that are um, written by a lawyer or, or written to suit uh, the ASIC requirements, uh, but they are quite quite engaging in the in the language. So they are they still cover off on the legal stuff, but you know they're, they're in layman's terms so clients understand what they're talking about. Uh, do you see value propositions being more successful in writing or given orally or both? Gavin, thank you. That's a great question as well. Um, one of the things that we saw, you know, I said earlier that, you know, you don't necessarily need to show the client your advice in order to get a, a, a greater fee, but you do need to be able to demonstrate value. And with the most successful firms, we found that they did that by uh, a combination of things. So a lot of firms are really looking at what we would call their client experience. So having a look at what their, um, you know, the journey that the client takes from the very first moment that they have an interaction with them. So, you know, we're seeing firms that have got great information on their website, they're having conversations on the phone, followed up by emails, followed up by links to different pieces of information. Um, you know, they're sort of, we're seeing more and more use of video as well, where advisors are either having a, a pre-made video that talks about the value proposition of their firm, um, or whether they're even following up after their meetings with a, a, a personalised video to the client. Um, often they are, they do have the written materials as well, so it might be a brochure um, that they then talk to the client about. Um, we've seen a number of them that even have documented things like where to from here, what's the process we're going to take you through. Um, and, and we're actually also seeing now, uh, it, I wouldn't say it is the majority of cases, but we're starting to see some where firms are actually having a um, a great SOA uh, delivery process. So it's not just a, a compliance related document that we know, oh, we'll just look at the executive summary and then people don't read the rest. They're actually putting flow charts, diagrams, um, graphical representations of things in their SOAs to make them a lot more user friendly and using them as a, um, a client engagement tool as opposed to just a, a compliance document. So uh, yeah, I would say that there is definitely the visual, the verbal and the written representation of the client um, value proposition that are in the businesses that we see the most success. Um, someone's given an anecdote. Recently came across a Sydney advisor who specialises in working with lawyers. Average fee per client, $34,000 per annum, 23 clients. Does specialisation work and is it only possible in Sydney or Melbourne? Um, uh, I would say, oh, uh, I don't want to talk in generalisations here. Where we see advisors in more regional and rural areas, yes, they tend to be saying that they need to service a broader uh, cross-section of clients because they may not necessarily have such a deep niche with the number of clients that they want to deal with. Um, we tend to see in smaller one advisor practices that they do tend to um, be specific. Uh, it's easy, um, 
they're more likely to niche. So they just deal with uh, a particular area of advice or they'll say no to more people because they're, you know, if their specialisation is in self-managed super fund, they're not going to spend the time going and, and figuring out Centrelink rules if they don't do that in, you know, the majority of cases. Um, where the businesses are starting to get more, um, more advisors working with them, if they're sort of getting to two, three, four advisors, then they tend to broaden a little bit more, um, which is kind of the opposite to what, what you know, people talk about, about being niche and, and identifying your target market. So I think that's about having specialists that can get that, oh, the crass term of greater share of wallet, uh, where you might have one person in the business that is the risk specialist and can get into some really deep, um, complex risk cases and, and then somebody else that is the self-managed super fund specialist and so forth. Um, there's a good question here. Um, Sorry, I've just there's so many here. I've just saw it a second ago, and I just want to get back to it here. It's about how can something be three thousand dollars? Help me out here, Liam. There's so many here, so I'll try and jump back to that slide as well. Did the okay three and a half thousand is too cheap? Yeah, hello. Um, let me just get back up here on my slides if I can jump. I'm trying to do things with three different screens here. Um, give me one moment and get back. Sorry folks, I'm just going to have to go back one at a time because it's not letting me get back to the main screen. If we go back here to the numbers, oh no, not case study. So um, did the $3,500 upfront fee include insurance commissions was one question. Um, and my answer is no. So the numbers that we included on the screen for the average fees charged uh, was the fee component of the advice. Uh, so that's where, you know, when you have the, the further detail and we break it down between those would take hybrid on top of that. Are we there? Uh, yeah, so this is the one where someone was saying, how can the average insurance own, oh, sorry, uh, has a median fee in the $3,300 range possible if the asset-based fee only advisors are charging 0.93 on average? What sort of average fund are they looking after? So where we were getting the specific dollar value for this particular slide and saying what was the dollar amount of the fee that you charge to your typical client? Um, the asset-based fee advisors would give us the dollar amount um, as a final number. So, you know, if their clients happen to be on average 100000 and they charge 1%, then that arrives at a, a $1,000 fee. Uh, so, uh, yes, there's a, a variety of different business models in there. Uh, there's not a... Um, there's not a rule of thumb that we found that those that charge an asset-based fee typically have higher net worth clients. Um, it was probably on the more often than not scale, but it wasn't significant enough for us to be able to actually call that out as a as a specific finding. Uh, drop in any other um, fees that you can talk about. Um, actually, there was another question here. How can the average insurance only fee be $2,508 and the average comprehensive advice fee be $3,300? I assume comprehensive fee is being discounted as the advisor anticipates also picking up the insurance commissions. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, Shane. Those figures that I shared with you were comprehensive advice. That was not including insurance advice. So we asked a separate question around when did you, what do you charge when you're doing comprehensive advice that includes insurance? Um, and we do have some numbers in there as well. And whenever I share these findings, it's it's really interesting because I'll walk away and I'll have some advisors that go, $3,500, that is way too cheap. How can anybody provide advice at that rate? And then I'll speak to somebody else that says, oh my goodness, I, I could never charge $3,500 to my clients. Uh, so it's always a subjective thing. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to be able to share the cross section of numbers that people are charging because, like I say, an average doesn't tell you the full story um, when you're looking at the different models that are there. Uh, so scrolling down through here, 
just some advisors lowball their some advisors lowball their engagement fee and pick it up on their ongoing fee. Um, yeah, look, we hear that anecdotally from advisors. You know, oh, look, I'd prefer to just bring the client on board, and I'm happy to do it as a loss leader because I know I'm going to make up the the money later on through their ongoing fee. We actually pulled that out to see, you know, those of you those those participants who charged a lower fee at the upfront, do they have a higher ongoing fee across the board, um, which would support that claim? And no is the answer to that. Um, uh, there wasn't always a uh, significant marriage between the two. Uh, you know, there are some practices. The other thing that we did find was how long has the business been in, in practice for? So, um, you know, is a business that's been around longer than 10 years where they're highly likely to have a higher level of ongoing uh, trail commission coming in or recurring service fees? You know, are they more likely to charge less for their ongoing, uh, for their engagement services because they have that subsidisation? Um, and uh, I can say empirically now that uh, they are not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily taking that into account. Uh, so we're still seeing some of the older firms as such, if you, if you like, if you, in terms of tenure, uh, that are still charging at the lower end um, of some of the advice fees and others that are right at the high end. So it's difficult from a qualitative perspective to run those calculations when you can't also do a crossover layer of the type of clients that people deal with. One of the other questions we looked at was who are you dealing with and so we had a whole range of different clients that we put up to people uh, and there was an option to say anyone who asked for my advice uh, as well as being specific about yes wealth creators, yes SMSFs, yes high net worth, whatever the case may be um, and we couldn't even uh, use that to give us the empirical because we still found that people would choose six or seven different types of clients um, and so uh, taking the averages across the board with so many different client types was, was difficult to have a a pure answer. That's why I think the client case studies are really important to have a look at because we can then see in the specific incidents of an actual real life client, well, hypothetical real life client situation, how does the fee model apply to them? Um, are advisors now becoming asset allocators? I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Are advisors now becoming asset allocators to justify their fees or did you find successful businesses still use simple, explainable uh, investment solutions? Uh, yeah, look, we, we also dug into whether they do direct equities or ETFs or if they're using SMAs or, or um, asset uh, based, um, sorry, the um, uh, asset, oh gosh, the words just lost me. So it's um, asset class investing and, and index funds. So there was no evidence to say that people are um, on the majority holding themselves out uh, as asset managers and investment specialists. If anything, there's probably a swing away from it. But I would say that um, those businesses that hired high EBITs and charged an asset-based fee did so successfully when um, they did have a value add in the asset management space. So um, as you would expect, it was more, would be more difficult for a client um, to understand if an advisor is purely using uh, perhaps an index fund or something passive uh, to then have an asset-based fee. So we certainly did see that in the data, um, that asset-based fees were more linked with uh, more specialist investment solutions, particularly when uh, they were resulting in a higher EBIT. So I guess my advice to you on that is, um, you know, if you are not the investor specialist, if that is not part of your value proposition and that's what we're seeing less and less of, uh, don't try to link your fee to um, purely an asset base uh, calculation because you're, you're talking about two different um, solutions there for a client. Uh, okay, so some thank yous, that's great. Um, that's all we have time for. As, you say, as I said, this is a very intricate subject and I could talk all day about it. Um, I wouldn't do that to you though. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this has been of value and uh, I will hand over to Liam. Yeah, well, thank you, Sue. Really fascinating discussion. We hope all you uh, listeners out there got something out of it and really enjoyed it. Um, apologies for those who have answered, who have asked questions and we didn't manage to to answer them all. Um, we will send those off to Sue and hopefully she can endeavour to answer them and we will email them to you, but please allow for a few days for that, as well as the recording of the presentation and the links to Sue's discount. Well, thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you for our next instalment of the webinar. Thank you very much. Ciao.